Hello, my name is Raffaella and I am here on behalf of the Literacy Alliance of Ontario. The Literacy Alliance formed after the Ontario Human Rights Commission launched the Right to Read Public Inquiry. We are an alliance of multiple literacy focus groups calling for the creation of a new evidence-based literacy or English language arts curriculum. This presentation will lay out the current state of literacy education and outcomes in Ontario and what the evidence tells us about how best to achieve our mission of ensuring meaningful and equitable access to literacy for all Ontario students. I know these are extremely busy times and I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in. A few years ago, the Ontario Human Rights Commission became aware and concerned that a large proportion of students were not reaching literacy standards due to current literacy practices in Ontario. And as, Ontario, as, and as former Ontario Human Rights Chief Commissioner Renu Mundane said, learning to read is not a frill, it is not a privilege, it is a basic and essential skill. Learning to read is a human right. In October of 2019, they launched the Right to Read Public Inquiry to investigate literacy instruction in Ontario. They are looking at curriculum and teaching methods, mandatory early screening using evidence-based screening tools, and evidence-based reading intervention. Their findings are expected in the next few months. When we look at learning to read outcomes, we see a discrepancy between what cognitive science research has shown about our ability to learn to read and the outcomes in Ontario. We know from science that about 30% of kids will learn to read easily, regardless of instructional quality. But for the other approximately 70%, learning to read depends on a lot of different factors. Are they receiving sufficient direct instruction on the foundational skills of reading? Are areas of difficulty being identified? When is this identification occurring? And are they getting the right intervention at the right time? We know from the research that when all these factors are in play, most children, over 95% in fact, regardless of background, can learn to read. But the results from Ontario tell a different story. We see a discrepancy between human potential and the current outcomes in Ontario students. We'll take, for example, the results of the 2018-2019 grade three EQAO. Based on these results, only 17% of students are excelling, which clearly falls short of the 30% expected to learn to read easily. 49% are meeting the basic standard, well short of the 70% expected. But more concerning is that one in three Ontario students, 33% are failing. They don't have adequate literacy skills. We also know that a child's success in Ontario, perhaps whether they will ultimately meet literacy standards or fail to do so, depends on many factors, including parental advocacy or the ability to pay for help outside of the school system. We will show what we will show is that in Ontario, this approximately one in three failure rate is not unique to this cohort, and it remains consistent through elementary, secondary, and post-secondary cohorts. Let's take a closer look at the grade three EQAO results. To orient you to this and the next few graphs, the blue bar is the unassisted pass rate, which is the pass rate in students who take the assessment on their own without assistive technology. The yellow with blue slashes is the assisted pass rate, which refers to the use of assistive technology such as a scribe or a screen reader. This captures a student's ability to comprehend text, which of course is important, but it does not provide information about their ability to decode and or write. We don't know how many of these students are able to decode, spell and write at benchmark on their own without the use of assistive technology. The red bar represents those students who failed to meet benchmark standards with or without technology. And gray represents students who did not participate in the assessment. Now back to the data. The grade three EQAO results over 15 years show similar and consistent results to those noted on the previous slide. These data include all students, including those with IEPs. The unassisted pass rate in blue has hovered around 60% for 15 years. The assisted pass rate in yellow adds to the pass rate slightly, but again, we don't know at what level these students can decode, spell, and write without the use of assistive technology. What all this means is that over the last 15 years, about 30% of Ontario grade three students have been failing to reach reading benchmarks as reflected in the red bars. Some years it's been as high as 40%. This bar depicts grade three EQAO reading results in students with IEPs, ex excluding gifted. We see increasing use of assistive technology over time, leading to the appearance of improved reading outcomes. Again, this gives us information about a student's ability to comprehend text that has been read to them 
or about their thoughts that have been scribed for them. It does not give us information about the student's ability to perform those skills on their own. However, what has been stable over time in students with IEP is a disappointing 10% or less unassisted pass rate and a failure to meet reading benchmarks in 40 to 50% of these students. Sometimes it's as high as 55%. We will show you data shortly that we do not have to accept these reading failure rates, even among our identified students. That was grade three data. How are students doing on the grade 10 Ontario Secondary School Literacy Test, the OSSLT? When we look at the OSSLT results for all students, we see a pass rate of only at or under 60% in the last decade, and only slightly higher in the few years prior to that. Turning to the results of the OSSLT in grade 10 students with IEPs, we actually see decreasing pass rates through the years with as low as 20% unassisted in recent years. Failure rates remain unacceptable at 35 to 40%. And this failure rate is most certainly higher if we look at the increasing non-participation rate in gray. We believe it would be safe to assume that a large proportion of students who did not write the OSSLT, perhaps the majority, would not have passed and therefore would push the failure rate well below, sorry, well above 40%. This is supported by some data from the Toronto District School Board showing that 70% of students who did not take the literacy test did not even apply for post-secondary education. This non-participation is a red flag. In this slide, we simply took the data from previous slides, grade three EQAO results for all students and the grade 10 OSSLT results for all students and combined them by cohort. To orient you, we have eight clusters reflecting eight cohorts. The first bar in each cluster shows the grade three EQAO results for that cohort. In the first cluster, it's the 2005 EQAO data. And the second bar in each cluster shows the grade 10 OSSLT results for the same cohort. In this case, the 2012 OSSLT data when the same grade three students were in grade 10. What's obvious from this data is that we do not see gains in literacy pass rates within cohorts from grade three to grade 10. There's an appearance of decreasing failure rates, but there is a concomitant increase in non-participation rate between grade three and grade 10. And we've actually, and we've already explained how those students who do not participate in the OSSLT assessment would likely not be successful had they taken the test. So the take home message here is that kids don't catch up. Grade three literacy performance is predictive of grade 10 performance. For the sake of time, we have not shown the data presented in this way for students with IEPs, but similar cohort themes are present with respect to lack of improvement in failure rates and even more pronounced non-participation rates going from grade three to grade 10. Switching our focus to post-secondary, what are the literacy skills of Ontario students who go on to post-secondary education? In 2016, the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario administered the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies to assess the competencies of incoming college and university students in literacy, numeracy, and problem solving. This was done as part of their Essential Adult Skills Initiative. These are the data from a sample of incoming college students in the area of literacy showing us that 33% of incoming students scored at or below level two. The Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario identified level three as the minimum proficiency level for Ontario's higher education graduates, and 33% did not meet this standard. So in Ontario, we see this consistent 30% failure rate between cohorts over time and through elementary, secondary, and post-secondary education. Literacy rates in grade three predict literacy rates in high school and heading into post-secondary. As a whole, students don't catch up. Who are the students at risk of being the one in three? There are many risk factors for low literacy, some of which are listed here. Students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, English language learners, racialized students, students with language deficits, students with learning disabilities such as dyslexia, and lack of access to private tutoring, be it due to, be it due to prohibitive costs, no available resources, or an unrecognized need. Overall, there is a lack of Ontario-specific race-based and socioeconomic status-based literacy data publicly available to highlight these inequalities. The most recent such data we could find is from the Toronto District School Board 2011 to 2012 EQAO results. 
That data is presented here, taken directly from the TDSB report, Right to Read, Closing Reading Gaps with Adolescent Learners report. This chart shows us the percentage of students who achieved a level three or above on grade three EQAO reading assessments in the 2011-2012 school year, according to family income. The data indicate a trend whereby the higher the family income, the greater the achievement in reading. For example, 85% of students whose families were in the highest income bracket achieved at least a level three, as compared to only 50% of 57% of students whose families were in the lowest income bracket. Although not shown here, this achievement gap is identical for the EQAO grade six and grade 10 OSSLT assessments for the same year. Looking at the TDSB reading data by self-identified racial group, it is apparent that success in reading is not equally distributed across racial groups. An obvious achievement gap exists when comparing students who self-identified as Black, Middle Eastern, and Latin American compared to students who self-identified as East Asian and white. Only 51% of self-identified Black students who took the test achieved a grade three or above compared to 80% of East Asian students and 76% of white students. Once again, similar results, sorry, once again, results are similar on the grade six EQAO and grade 10 OSSLT assessments of the same year. So these data reveal a pattern of disadvantage in reading for students from lower income families and based on self-identified racial group. And as opposed to the previous EQAO data presented, these data are based only on the students who sat for the assessment. We have no data on the non-participation rate by group. As well, pass rate reflects a level three or four achievement and includes those who achieve those levels both with and without the use of assistive technology. We have already addressed potential issues with high non-participation rates and assistive technology use. I would also like to add that specific reading data for Indigenous students in the Toronto District School Board was unavailable during the writing of the report. But the report does note that provincial and board level data on Indigenous students indicates significant achievement gaps. Why should we care that approximately 30% of Ontario students are failing to meet literacy standards? We know that literacy puts individuals at risk for a number of negative outcomes, including limited educational and life opportunities, lower economic participation in lifetime earnings, increased likelihood of poverty and homelessness, higher risk of mental health issues and suicide, reduced democratic participation, reduced health outcomes, increased likelihood of being the victims of abuse, and higher rates of involvement in crime and, and incarceration. In fact, 65% of those incarcerated in Canada have lower than elementary level literacy skills. But there are also emotional impacts of reading failure on children and their families as articulated by Marcus, a 10 year old Ontario boy. He said, I couldn't read and everyone else could. I felt like a complete and total idiot. Sometimes I wished I would just die so I could stop feeling so stupid. As Louisa Motes, a reading researcher notes, the tragedy here is that most reading failure is unnecessary. She goes on to add that when placed into schools with effective principals, strong curricula, and well-supported teachers, virtually all students can learn to read as well as the most advantaged students. With evidence-based instruction, over 95% of kids can learn to read. We should not accept a 30% plus failure rate. We just have to turn to Canadian data to see this borne out. Let's compare our current outcomes in reading to outcomes produced when an evidence-based approach is implemented in Canada. In the early 2000s, Lasso and Siegel implemented an evidence-based literacy curriculum for a cohort of North Vancouver students starting in kindergarten and continuing through their primary grades. This included evidence-based general classroom instruction and evidence-based assessments and interventions as needed. They were followed through elementary school. All children were tested in the fall of their kindergarten year and classified as at risk for reading failure or not at risk. Based on these results, 23.8% of English as first language students were deemed at risk. Children were tested again in the spring of grade two. After three years of evidence-based literacy instruction, only 4.2% of students were classified as reading disabled. Almost 96% of students were at or above standard. These students were followed through grade to grade seven and literacy levels were sustained over time. We see even larger gains in, in English language learners of the same cohort. A larger percentage of ELL students were deemed at risk 
at 37.2%. By the end of grade two, only 3.7% of students were classified as reading disabled. Ontario EQAO data shows ELL students underperforming their non-ELL counterparts. These North Vancouver data clearly show that being an ELL learner is not a barrier to, language, to literacy achievement. When evidence-based literacy instruction is provided, they do as well as their non-ELL counterparts. The same North Vancouver study also showed that an evidence-based literacy curriculum mitigated the negative influence of socioeconomic status on word reading development. More recently, in a similar study carried out in Edmonton by Dr. Yor Yu, evidence-based classroom instruction along with screening and, inter and early intervention was introduced in 11 public schools. By grade three, less than 2% of students did not meet reading standards. The 2% were students most severely affected by multiple exceptionalities, such as having cochlear implants and autism. What these studies show us is that we do not need to accept a 30% failure rate. Evidence-based reading instruction works and it works across the board for English as a first language students, for ELL students, for students from low SES households, and for most students with learning disabilities, we can do better. How do we do this? What exactly is an evidence-based approach? What did they do in North Vancouver and Edmonton to decrease the failure rate to less than 5%? First, the approach used was based on science. Reading is the most studied aspect of learning. There is a lot of evidence to draw upon. And one indisputable finding is that reading does not develop naturally like learning to speak. Most people need to be taught to read and the science guides us on how best to do this. The simple view of reading serves as a useful starting point to discuss this research. We all agree that comprehension is the goal of reading and the simple view illustrates that reading comprehension is the product of two things. Our ability to transform printed words into spoken language, also known as decoding, and our ability to understand spoken language. If there are weaknesses in either of these, it will result in poor reading comprehension. We know that reading decoding, sorry, we know that reading weak decoding skills is the primary deficit for many kids who struggle to learn to read. This is important because a key finding of reading research is that the most efficient way to learn words so that they can be instantly recognizable is to decode them, that is sound them out. It is by going through this process that the word is stored in a manner that allows for instant recall. This is known as orthographic mapping. It follows then that to build a large bank of instantly recognizable words, kids need to have the skills required to sound out words, and they need a lot of opportunities to apply those skills while reading. The evidence shows that the most efficient way to do this is to teach reading and writing skills systematically and explicitly through a phonics-based approach starting in kindergarten. Systematically means that skills are taught in a logical order, starting with simple skills and building to more complex skills. Explicitly means that the skills are taught directly. The teacher explains, models, and leads the students through guided practice. Nothing is left for the students to figure out on their own. For example, the letters IGH read as I is directly taught, as opposed to assuming that students will figure that out on their own by reading words such as might and fight. It is important to assess the underlying skills needed for reading early to identify students at risk for reading difficulties before they fall behind. This can be achieved using reliable, validated, and easy to administer screening tools in the classroom. The results of the screening should be used to guide evidence-based interventions for students beginning in kindergarten and no later than grade one. Why does early intervention matter so much? Why not wait and see if children will catch up? because studies have shown that it takes four times as long to intervene in grade four as it does in kindergarten, not to mention the negative mental health and emotional impacts experienced by the child as a result of failing repeatedly. How does an evidence-based approach differ from how literacy is taught in Ontario? First of all, the Ontario approach is based on a view that reading is something that will develop naturally in time with little direct instruction if children are simply exposed to enough books. This doesn't align with the findings that the vast majority of kids, 70%, will not learn to read easily just through exposure to print. Their outcomes are highly dependent on the quality of instruction. Secondly, the Ontario curriculum emphasizes a three queuing approach to reading to word identification as opposed to decoding. So what does a three queuing approach look like? 
Well, when a child comes to a word they don't know, rather than being told to look at all the letters and sound it out, they are encouraged to use a variety of strategies to guess the word. For example, the first one here, eagle eye, directs students to look at the picture and consider what is in the picture that starts the beginning letter. Or lips the fish, directs students to get their lips ready, say the beginning sound, and somehow the rest of the word will flow from there. Or skippy the frog on the bottom row, it says simply skip the word, read the rest of the sentence, and based on the context, context, guess what the word might be. This is in direct contrast to what the evidence tells us about the most efficient way to learn new words. As mentioned in the last slide, it is by sounding out new words that they are stored for instant recall. When words are not sounded out, but instead guessed, an opportunity is missed for the student to have that word added to their bank of instantly recognizable words. The current curriculum does not include specific and measurable expectations for the foundational skills needed for spelling, writing, and decoding words. There is currently no standard universal evidence-based approach to early screening or assessment. As well, there is no standard approach to intervention, and if intervention happens at all, it usually happens too late. There is too much variability in who qualifies for intervention, the availability of that intervention, and the quality of that intervention. Here is an excerpt from Ontario's language curriculum. The top line of the curriculum states that in order to read unfamiliar words, students should predict, not decode, but predict the meaning of and solve unfamiliar words using the three cueing approach as explained on the previous slide. Phonics instruction is not mandate, mandated or even stressed. David Kilpatrick, a psychologist and reading researcher says, the three cueing system is the way poor readers read. And if teachers use the cueing system to teach reading, they're not just teaching children the habits of poor readers, they are actually impeding the orthographic mapping process. Three cueing can actually prevent the critical learning that's necessary for a child to become a skilled reader. Brain imaging studies show us that skilled readers don't actually use the three cueing system to become skilled readers. They intuitively turn to phonics to decode words. They do this in spite of three cueing instruction, not because of it. When we use three cueing, three cueing instruction in school, we are actually teaching students the strategies weaker readers use to read, not the strategies skilled readers use. When evidence-based reading instruction based on the science of reading is brought into the general education classroom, large-scale reading success is achievable and has been demonstrated. The next two slides will highlight two U.S. school districts that have dramatically improved reading outcomes even amongst at-risk student populations. These are data from a Pennsylvania school district that moved from three queuing literacy instruction to evidence-based instruction presented by socioeconomic status. These are the results from students at the end of kindergarten after curriculum change and continued teacher training in the science of reading. There is a lot of information to be gleaned from this experience. First, this is a school district that includes students from all socioeconomic statuses, ranging from schools that have as low as 13% of students from low-income households, to schools where 97% of students come from low-income households. Let's turn to those two extremes. I'd like to first draw your attention to Hanover, which was the school in the district with the most affluent students. Only 13% were from low SES households. In the first year of the study, 70% of students were on track for reading success at the end of kindergarten, which means that 30% were still, were still at risk for reading failure. After four years, 100% of students leaving kindergarten had the skills needed to become proficient readers. Now look at Dunnigan. This is the school with the highest rates of students from low SES households at 97%. In the first year of the study, only 30% of kids were on track for reading success. Remember that slide from the beginning, 30% will learn to read regardless of the quality of instruction. Four years later, 69% of students were set up for reading success. Across the board, all schools recorded significant improvements over only four years. Over these years, teachers continue to undergo professional development. And this speaks not only to the impact of quality teacher instruction in the general classroom, but also how outcomes continue to improve as the quality of teacher instruction continues to improve. These are data from a Louisiana school district, which includes 32 elementary schools where 94% of students qualify for Title I, which in the US reflects the percentage of students from low income families, and where 43% of students are black. In 2016, 46% of students in kindergarten were reading on or above grade level. 
After science of reading training and implementation, 99% of kindergartens were reading at or above grade level the very next year. So why aren't we following best practices? What's standing in our way? Well, the biggest issue, as psychologist and reading researcher Mark Seidenberg, Mark Seidenberg points out, is that very little of what we've learned about reading as scientists has had any impact on what happens in schools. So there's a disconnect between what we have learned through science and research about how the brain learns to read and what is being taught in schools. We need to bridge that gap. This is not an issue that is unique to Ontario. It is present across Canada and across the English speaking world. Other areas have begun to work towards an evidence-based approach, which includes systematic phonics instruction. Take for example, England. In the mid 2000s, the English government commissioned an independent inquiry into reading instruction, which examined the gap between research and practice. In 2006, the Rose Report was published with recommendations including immediately replacing three queuing instruction with systematic explicit instruction in decoding. The government took immediate action by requiring teachers to teach decoding skills systematically and explicitly to all students beginning the next school year. They also began to develop a new literacy curriculum for all grades, which was rolled out over the next few years. In 2012, it became compulsory that all grade one students undergo the National Phonics Screening Check. This is a simple assessment of a student's ability to decode real and nonsense words to ensure that they actually have the skills and knowledge to sound words out. The English curriculum follows the evidence on the most effective and efficient way to teach all students how to read. What has been the impact on outcomes for Ontario, which continues to use three queuing, compared to England, which has moved to an evidence-based phonics approach? While well, the first Pearl study following the implementation of England's new curriculum occurred in 2016. In this international reading literacy study, you can see that England made large gains while Ontario's pass rate declined. England's scores improved across the board, but the largest gains were made in the average scores of the kids in the bottom 10%. England's scores at the 10th percentile in 2016 were higher than any previous Pearl cycle and it was 15 points higher than their score on the 2011 pearls. The evidence for a phonics-based approach to reading instruction is so overwhelming and one-sided that New South Wales in Australia has followed England's lead and no longer supports a three queuing, uh, and no longer supports three queuing programs such as reading recovery. Starting next year, phonics will be compulsory for every, every year one class across New South Wales. All year one students will have to undergo a phonics screening check. And phonics is so fundamental to reading acquisition that every primary school will also have a phonics target they will be expected to meet. Of course, students will be provided with professional, sorry, of course, teachers will be provided with professional development. As the New South Wales Minister for Education recently said, quote, it is a crying shame that parts of the education and community are so blinded by ideology, they cannot bring themselves to accept the evidence in favor of phonics that is sitting in front of them. She continues, quote, a faculty of medicine would not allow anti-vaxxers to teach medical students. She goes on to explain that faculties of education should not allow phonics, phonics skeptics to teach future elementary teachers. The current Ontario cur curriculum is not only failing our students, it is shortchanging our teachers as well by not giving them all the tools and information they need to be successful in their efforts at teaching children to read. Consider this quote from a teacher from Thunder Bay who discovered the science of reading when she learned she didn't have the skills she needed to help her own child learn to read. There have always been children I couldn't reach no matter what I tried. When they left my classroom at the end of the year, I couldn't help but feel as though I had failed them. 15 years into my career, I discovered the science of reading and everything changed. I finally feel like I have the knowledge and skills to help every child. So how can we fix it and where do we start? Do we start with teacher training, implementing screeners, creating policies to standardize interventions in special education? It all starts with the curriculum. When we have 30% or more of our students struggling to learn to read, this is not a special education issue. This is a general education issue. In Ontario, the provincial curriculum guides all decisions around instruction. For example, 
Universities train teachers in instructional methods that align with the curriculum. So when the curriculum mandates a three queuing approach, that is what teachers learn in Teachers College. This drives classroom instruction and choice of classroom resources. Assessment is designed to measure curriculum expectations. So when the curriculum expectations are vague, the results of the assessments are less meaningful, making it difficult to accurately understand how a child is doing with foundational skills. This has downstream effects on intervention in terms of who is identified, when they are identified, and who gets intervention. The curriculum also influences the effectiveness of intervention in two other ways. One, either the intervention is simply a more intense version of the ineffective curriculum, or if the program is in fact evidence-based, much effort must be spent to unlearn the habits of three queuing taught previously, only to have the student return to a classroom where three queuing continues to be taught. When the curriculum is changed to reflect an evidence-based approach, everything else will follow. Teacher training, classroom instruction, classroom resources, assessment, and intervention. But we can't forget that tier one general classroom instruction is the foundation of any curriculum. Evidence-based general classroom instruction that aligns with the science of reading will meet the needs of the largest number of students, thereby reducing the burden on special education services. As the Literacy Alliance, we have come together to call for the creation of an evidence-based literacy curriculum for Ontario that aligns with what the Ontario Human Rights Commission has identified as key components for an evidence-based system-wide approach to literacy instruction, including evidence-based systematic and, it's, and explicit instruction for all students starting in kindergarten, specific and measurable expectations for all foundational skills of reading, writing, and spelling, universal and standardized early screening and ongoing assessment to identify students at risk, and a standard framework for intervention for all students at risk for reading failure. Across all strands, we also need relevant and objective data collection and analysis to ensure we are meeting goals and continuously improving literacy outcomes. Finally, like all areas of science, the science of reading will continue to evolve. Curriculum and instruction must evolve with the evolution of the science of reading. Ontario's current three queuing curriculum is not aligned with what the science of reading tells us about how to teach kids to read. And currently in Ontario, there are at least 600,000 students who are struggling with literacy. This is truly a human rights issue. By continuing to ignore the evidence, we are creating a segment of our population who are not able to, for, to fully participate in society or gain meaningful employment. Many may turn to crime or experience lifelong mental health consequences. An evidence-based approach to general classroom reading instruction improves literacy education and outcomes. We can get our literacy failure rate down from approximately 30% to less than 5%. We have known how to do this for a long time. It's time to stop failing our students and in turn take pressure off our special education resources, which will help ensure that those resources can be focused on students who are most in need of them and that they have access to those resources in a timely fashion. The long-term costs of not addressing Ontario's literacy crisis far exceed the short-term cost of curriculum change. We have an obligation to address this. Findings from Ontario's Right to Read inquiry are expected in the next few months, and the Literacy Alliance of Ontario is committed to advocating for the implementation of their recommendations. We welcome all interested parties to join us in our efforts to ensure that every child can realize their right to read. Thank you once again for taking the time to listen. We will leave you with a list of resources should you wish to learn more about the science of reading. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or comments. Thank you.